Good morning and welcome to the Transportation Infrastructure and Planning Subcommittee meeting of February 15th. I hope everyone had a wonderful Valentine's Day yesterday. Um, so I'm going to call the meeting to order at 10.05 and we're going to have our city attorney explain public comment. Mr. Benton. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. During citizen comment, members of the public may address the subcommittee for up to three minutes on issues of interest or concern to them. The Arizona open meeting law permits the subcommittee members to listen to the comments but prohibits members from discussing or acting on the matters presented. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, our next item is call to public. I, I have a list here. Is he, it doesn't say what item is it is, is it? For just public, public comment, not a specific item. Mr. Wilson? Oh, I'm sorry, you're here in person. We're so used to having everyone call in. I, I'm sorry, please. Hi, sorry, I was starting a lot faster. I thought I was gonna be speaking at the end. Well, thank you for, uh, thank you for, get, for hearing me today. So um, I, I live on 7th Avenue, um, which is a very, very busy street. I just wanted to create awareness for, for that street. Um, that I don't know if you guys have ever heard this term. The first time I ever heard it was suicide lane was from p police officers that are there. Um, I live right on the street. I've only seen police officers monitoring it once in the three and a half years that I've lived there. Um, I know that from, from what I've been told, because I've lived here for three and a half years, is that 7th Street and 7th Avenue were created um, as a kind of thoroughfare to, to, you know, for express lanes prior to the 51 and 17 existing. And so one of, the, one of the issues that we have with 7th Street and 7th Avenue right now is that both of those streets um, almost encourage speeding and freeway-like speeds. Um, back in November, I lost my dog on that street because he got hit by a car. Um, which, which very, very unfortunate, of course, but, um, I'm, you know, I, I take my son, uh, biking on that street all the time in, in the trailer behind me. And I've almost been hit on that, uh, on that street, just walking across on an, on an unmarked crosswalk, um, from drivers who are going 60 miles an hour and blowing right in front of me. And even my neighbors have been hit pulling out of our neighborhood uh, on that street. So, um, w one of the things that I wanted, one, create awareness and two, ask if you guys could look at the planning for 7th Avenue and, and do anything that you can to reduce speed on that, whether it's up, updated police enforcement um, or even restriping it, getting rid of what we call the suicide lanes. I mean, I, you, you, can't, you can't turn left going south onto, uh, onto any of the main streets um, at, after 4 p.m. 3.58 p.m. I was trying to turn left and I got flipped off by, by drivers the other day because you know people and people just don't kind of understand and look at the timing of it so we drive too aggressively it's not a good street to to walk down cars are blowing by you at 60 miles an hour even going for a run on that street i i i, I, I worry all the time that a car is going to get out of control and hit me because you know it, it, it car it, it almost encourages cars to drive 60 miles an hour on it when it's a posted 40 40 mile an hour zone so thank you guys for listening to me i just wanted to bring awareness to that and see what we may be able to do about 7th Avenue and 7th Street. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. We're not allowed to speak back to you, um, but we're all biting our lips because speeding is a big issue. But we do have our street transportation director here, and perhaps you can grab him and he can talk a little bit about what we're attempting to do. Thank you very much for your comments. So our next item is approval of minutes. Do I have a motion? So moved. I, second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? It carries unanimously. The next items, two and three, are for consent. Um, do I have a motion? So oh. moved. Second. We're having a race here. Yeah, no. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 And have a Any long opposed? Meeting. Okay, the <laughs> ayes have it. The next items, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 are all for information only. Are there any questions or do you want any presentations? I got my questions answered, so. All I'm right, okay. thank you. Okay, then we'll move on to item 11 to talk about the airport land reuse update. 
Yes, Madam Chair, here to talk about the airport land reuse update is Chad Makovsky, Air Aviation Services Director, along with Deputy Aviation Director Jordan Feld, and Christine Mackey, Community and Economic Development Director, as well as uh, Courtney Brown from the Economic Development Department. Chad. Thank you, Mario, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, members of the subcommittee. Happy to be here today, and uh, even happier to be joining forces with the Community Economic Development Department as we talk about the future uses of land west of the airport. You know, Sky Harbor Airport continues to excel and grow and support our growing community. Uh, as you all know, we have a, a roughly $38.8 billion ad annual economic impact, supporting more than 57,000 jobs on and around our airport. Uh, but with that growth comes impact, and we recognize the impact that we've had on surrounding communities, especially to the west of the airport. Uh, and over the years, we have worked with the FAA, worked with the community, uh, worked with this council body uh, to um, strategically acquire certain land parcels, to do noise insulation on certain parcels. And over that time, we've amassed uh, over 800 parcels of land. Now, uh, that impact to the community is significant, and, uh, and we are pretty excited today to talk about next steps in terms of how we're going to turn that land that we own in, back into productive uses. So uh, we had a recent milestone. We're excited to, uh, to share that with you. Just uh, to give the council uh, a little bit more of a, a sense as to the history and, and what that is about, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Jordan Feld. He's our Deputy Aviation Director over Planning and Environmental. Uh, and then we'll uh, turn it over to Chris Mackey and Courtney to talk a little bit about the land reuse task force that we've assembled and where we're heading from here. So, Jordan. Thanks, Chad. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, appreciate the opportunity. I'll try to be brief. Uh, Mr. Carter and Ms. Mackey will we'll talk a lot about the exciting stuff here. But by way of uh, quick background, uh, as Chad mentioned, there's, there's a bit of history to the acquisition of the parcels we're about to talk about and kind of the context of the area today and moving forward, how we did the land reuse strategy planning and, and, and those efforts. Uh, we'll talk about the, the stakeholders that were involved in the LRS planning, the recommendations that came out of that process, and as Mr. Mikowski noted, more recently, the FAA Section 163 determination that kind of frees up the land now for, for putting it back into productive use. And then we'll turn it over to, to Community and Economic Development to talk about the, the, the key implementation steps. So here is the land reuse planning area, two square miles, uh, Washington on the north, 7th Street on the west, 16th Street on the east, University on the south. And you're seeing the general noise exposure in the area going back to the early 90s when we completed our Part 150 and then created the Community Noise Reduction Program where we went about either uh, sound insulating homes in the area, thousands of homes were, were sound insulated in the area, and we also did a voluntary acquisition program. Approximately 800 parcels were acquired in that la land reuse planning area box you see in front of you. Uh, this is a, a zoom in on the area today. You can see on, on any given block there is a mixture of vacant lots, housing, non-residential uses, and so uh, that alone kind of creates a challenge for uh, redevelopment. It certainly uh, creates a challenge for community members as well. There, there's quality of life issues with the number of vacant blocks uh, on these lots. And to, to give an example of kind of what you would see if you were to drive down one of the streets, this is pretty close to Herrera School, uh, south of Buckeye, and, and pretty representative of, of what would you, you would see there. So the FAA actually recognized this problem and in 2012, they created a pilot grant to do redevelopment planning in areas like this. The airport was very lucky to get that pilot grant, and that was kind of the underpinning for the land reuse strategy planning pro process that we undertook in beginning in 2015. That process lasted three years, extensive stakeholder involvement, uh, won a, a state planning award for, for public involvement, in fact, uh, and very successful in defining goals for the area, revitalization strategies, and a, a myriad of, of redevelopment goals with respect to small parcels or being able to assemble parcels into a larger site. So all of that went into the land reuse strategy process that the council reviewed, forwarded to FAA, and ultimately approved by the FAA. So this is the, the, probably the key product of the land reuse strategy. This is the, the conceptual planning map. You can see there are three things called out immediately, spark areas one, two, and three. It was really critical to the community, given the uh, challenges with redeveloping land like this, 
uh, that there be some kind of synergy sites in the different areas, something that would serve as a catalyst to spark other redevelopment activity in the area. So that's what the spark area sites are, and you can see them at 14th and Washington, 7th and Buckeye, and excuse me, I-17 and 16th Street. Each has kind of a, a unique land use goal to it, and uh, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. Compatible development is obviously a key to all of this, so making sure that we're, we're not introducing new challenges with respect to aviation or airport noise, which will likely always be present at some level in this area. The cultural corridor was another key element in the community recommendations. They wanted to be able to connect the different areas. There's obviously a rich uh, cultural heritage to this area that is very much brought out through the uh, planning policies of, of the cultural trail corridor, I should say. And, uh, lastly, uh, the plan recommended the formation of an oversight task force to help with the implementation activities. And again, uh, Mr. Carter will, will talk to that in, in more detail. So wrapping up here, uh, the, the, the key thing, the, the, the new thing to share is that uh, recently the FAA made their FAA uh, Section 163 determination. There was a bit of law in the 2018 FAA Reauthorization Act that basically put in that if the airport's land wasn't needed for an aviation purpose over time, then the FAA should essentially get out of the way when it comes to the red tape with NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, um, and, and you know, putting land disposals in the Federal Register, things like that that can be very time consuming. So the determination frees up about 400 parcels in these blocks you can see on the map, A through J. These were the priority parcels for redevelopment. So it frees up that land to essentially now be sold or, or long-term leased for the, 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 the planning vision um, of the land reuse strategy. Of course, there's a lot of stipulations on that that uh, CED and, and aviation and planning will need to work on in terms of uh, rezoning, uh, deed restrictions, and navigation easement to, across the various parcels. And, and lastly, to, to wrap up here, while there's about 300 parcels not included in this initial determination, it's not to say that those parcels can't be used on a short-term basis. In fact, a lot of the land reuse strategy for that, that area that's not included in blocks A through J talks to that effort, the, the pop-up parks, the temporary uses, things like that. Uh, that, c that can be done in the near term. So with that, happy to turn it over to Chris and Courtney. Good morning, Ma Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. We are so beyond excited to finally get the opportunity to execute on the community's vision of what they studied for a, a more than two years long process. Uh, Aviation uh, Director Mikoski will testify that I think I war whooped in December when he called me to tell me that we had the approval from the FAA and ready to go forward. So we uh, immediately got to work. The, the internal group met. We put together our strategy of what needed to happen so we could start to execute on the community's vision quickly. Those things that we kind of made that checklist of, of things is to move through zoning. So of course we'll want to make sure the zoning's compatible with the TOD plan and with the community's vision as to what they wanted to happen there. There's a lot of land parcels. We could you know, do a shotgun approach and, and come at this from a, a, a big direction, but instead we think that you focusing, we've got great interest along Jefferson in area one to bring in mixed use residential and that's been cleared by the FAA as allowed for mixed use residential. In that area, we have um, an area D. It's an area that is planned for entertainment and recreation uses for the community. We think that's a very quick move forward. As this council knows, as part of the bond proceeds, economic development did ask as one of the vote items to be some additional funding to help make some of these parcels more contiguous. You know, you might have four or five city-owned, aviation-owned parcels, and then two or three private-owned parcels, and then more city-owned parcels. So to execute on the community's plan, additional assembly through us and through the private sector will be needed to, to execute against that. We met with the attorneys and talked about the deed restrictions and how in a public offering we can move those forward to say, you know, if you purchase these sites from the city of Phoenix, City of Phoenix has first right of refusal if you sell them in the future so that we make sure that they're used for uh, in the vision and, and in protection of Sky Harbor. Uh, so we are, are just absolutely thrilled to get to work on this. 
We see this more, and, and the council is so familiar with this, on our more challenged sites, what we've done with uh, the Del Rio landfill, the TGen building, our human resources building, what we've done with a number of our more challenged properties at where we have not come forward successfully with an RFP is we've taken them out for a public offering. What we do is it's very similar to a, an RFP. We post them on the city's website. We say what the community envisioned to be on that site. Individuals can then call us with the interest in those parcels. We work through a competitive process. We have a panel that's made up of the community, that's made up of planning, aviation, and economic development. And then we do bring those items forward to council for your consideration. You'll remember our most recent building we did that with was 24th and Jefferson. And I think we'd all agree that the project going forward there with the Arizona Impact Center is incredible. So again, these are, these are properties that it's gonna take a lot of working directly with the city, with aviation, with the community. So we think a public offering, but handled much like an RFP, but where the communication can free flow from the council to the proposers with us, with different departments is the way to go. So uh, Mr. Carter is going to walk you through an update and a refresher on the aviation land reuse strategy, and then we'll take questions from you. Thank you. Chris, Madam Chair and uh, committee members, uh, thank you for the time this morning. As uh, both Chris and uh, Jordan uh, mentioned earlier, uh, one of the main recommendations that came out of the land reuse study and planning effort and community collaboration process was uh, an understanding that there needed to be sustained uh, advocacy and oversight of the community's objectives, uh, ensuring that they actually show up in the developments that are proposed in the revitalization programming that is um, uh, released or, or funded for the area. With, with that, I'll go over briefly what the objectives and the goals are of the task force, some pre-development actions that Chris has already mentioned, uh, many of them already, we'll go through that, and then also the development process at sort of a timeline. Right, so the overarching uh, theme of the land reuse strategy is community revitalization, development, and uh, inv investment, infrastructure investment, for example. And as Chris said, we've, got, we've been at this for many, many years. The task force uh, was formed in May of uh, 2021 and is set to sunset this uh, May. Uh, there are uh, a number of uh, community groups and businesses that are participating in this effort, just a few of them you see here on this slide. And then, of course, we have several of the uh, city departments that have been invo involved from the beginning, even pre-land reuse strategy, as well as all of the active neighborhood associations that are in the area. So the task force mission, again, reinvest, revitalize, and redevelop. And some of the, you'll, you'll see on the right side of the uh, screen, some of the uh, results of the uh, strategy and planning effort, as well as in the upper right-hand corner, one of the main concerns that we attempted to address in the strategy, uh, one of the main concerns that the community has had over many decades, even pre-VARS. Um, pre, uh, Can I ask a question? Sure. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, <laughs> I'm like, I I'm so deep into this. Uh, if you could go back to 11. It says home and yard rehab. Um, and me knowing that area very well, there's scattered homes in there. So that's their land. And if they choose not to sell it, because if I look at the map correctly, there are homes in there um, that currently are not the cities. So are we saying that then um, with this home and yard rehab to get them to rehabilitate their homes or are we are gonna, we're offering these grants and loans to them? So we know that there are, um as you pointed out, the, the makeup of the area is uh, quite challenging. Um, but many of the folks that chose to remain in, in place 
uh, have also um, had have presented to us that they've had challenges with health and safety um, issues in their in and around their homes. And so we didn't want to wash over that as part of our outreach. We wanted to include that, study it, and come up with solutions that can be executed on. Uh, the home and uh, yard uh, rehab proposal uh, has involved neighborhood services, but also looking at private, more flexible funding um, that the community can can take advantage of. And that's still, we're still doing that outreach and investigation. And Madam Chair, Councilman Pastor, yes. That is exactly what the program is for. We have wonderful citizens who choose to live in the area. They have lovely homes, and there are fund sources that we can help them as they look on their home revitalization and their yard revitalization. Through the land reuse uh, strategy, the planning process, we developed a what we call an implementation toolkit, as you see on the right, right side there. Um, this, the toolkit is meant to guide redevelopment and revitalization efforts in the area. It's, pretty comp it's fairly comprehensive and includes uh, ideas like community enhancing programming. Uh, Chris had mentioned things like pocket parks. Um, how can we uh, leverage the, some of the aviation properties to provide community beneficial um, uses as the market catches up to the inventory that we have? Um, additionally, elements of the cultural corridor, uh, the task force is, for, is focused on activating as well as um, advocating for infrastructure improvements. So here's some of to address uh, uh, the councilman's uh, comment. Um, here are some of the examples of our efforts to um, identify funds that uh, go above and beyond the redevelopment of the aviation land. We understand that improving the area is going to enhance the, both the value of the aviation portfolio, the city's portfolio in the area, but also obviously improve the quality of life for those that are there now and those that we hope to attract to the area. Madam Chair, can, uh, Madam Chair members of the committee, uh, we're really excited. So District Aid and Economic Development submitted for a grant for the Yuma Street Pocket Park, which is one of the really cool parks that the community really would love to see go first. I got noticed last week that we got scheduled for our interview. So we've made it through the first process and we have an interview scheduled on the funding for the Yuma Street Pocket Park. Very excited that we could see that come to fruition quickly. earlier, um, Jordan and Chris uh, referred to our first redevelopment opportunity, the public offering that we hope to see uh, the, uh, hit the streets the end of this quarter, by the end of this quarter rather, and this is proposing a mixed use, mixed income housing uh, development uh, with ground floor activation at uh, 14th Street and 15th Street along Jefferson North Side. Immediately on, across the street from this proposed development or this conceptual drawing, rather, is uh, Pilgrim Rest Baptist Church to orient you. So what's happening next? Our timeline looks, looks much like this. Um, the Spark area, uh, next week we'll be doing an update to the community, updating them on the FAA's response and what we're going to do next in working with them. Uh, the public offering for Spark Area 1's redevelopment, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, Chris already discussed uh, much of the pre-development due diligence efforts that are occurring now and will continue. Um, and then we will uh, come back at a later date to seek council approval for um, a land disposal plan that we're still working on, finalizing. Uh, there will be at some point this year, we think, a transition of the task force, as I mentioned earlier. The task force is slated to sunset in May of this year. Uh, however, we realize that given the timing of the FAA's response, we're probably going to need more um, runway. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, more time with the task force or some version of an organization that's going to help us advocate, review, and um, advance the land use strategy. And then uh, finally, uh, hopefully we see Human Street Pocket Space uh, groundbreaking by the end of this year, which is one of the temporary lot activation concepts. And speaking of Human Street, I wanted to give you uh, an example of what it is we're talking about, these interim uses. This is at Buckeye, uh, I'm sorry, just uh, two block, two, three blocks south of Buckeye between 11th and 12th Streets on the left of the pink uh, rectangle you see there. That is um, uh, head out of, uh, head out of school um, 
public, uh, sorry, not public, uh, performing arts school, uh, elementary school. And then to the right is the former Maricopa Skills Center, now Gateway Community College, Central City Campus. And the concept for that. Councilwoman. I was going to ask a question about the pocket space, but you're going into it, so I, I shut. <laughs> well, let me get right to the, to the fun and games then. Um, so this is the current condition, as you can imagine, lots of uh, beautiful river rock. And here's what that might look like activated. I want to point out that this concept was born out of the community. National Broadway Neighborhood Association presented that to us, to an idea of activating these six contiguous parcels mid-block that otherwise are not, not in, the, in their current form, not truly marketable or developable. So uh, this uh, shows sort of what the experience could be in the space. We also researched uh, uh, different type of materials that could be used or, or, or uh, possibly be used um, to actually uh, develop the space. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Chris and Jeff. Thank you, Courtney, and uh, Chris and Jordan. And so we, we are really excited to move this forward. It's, it's about time. We've had this land for quite a long time. It actually uh, comes at an expense to the airport. We spend almost $700,000 a year just maintaining these empty lots, and we'd love to turn these into beautiful revenue-producing lots that are compatible with the, uh, the de desires of the local community as well. And so with that, we'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, and by the way, congratulations on Monday. You made it through it. <laughs> Thank I you. Uh, Monday was our Super Bowl at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> Very busy day. Does anyone have a question, Councilwoman? Thank you. Yeah, I just want to um, thank you so much to everyone, Chad, Chris, the whole team. I think it's. I think this is an amazing plan um, in terms of really revitalizing um, an area. Also, want to thank Councilmember Garcia for all of his hard work and pushing for the task force to really exist. And you know, our neighbors are amazing, right? Especially when they live in that area and the vision that they had in terms of making sure that we continue to represent the culture, that we continue to put the community first, which is something um, that I know District 8 has always, always done and getting the input from the community has always been important. And, and look at all these great things that, you know, together with all of you um, that they were able to come up with. So I think this is um, very exciting, excited to see what's gonna come up of all of this um, and all the hard work that everyone is doing. And also, um, big shout out to all of those neighbors that have taken time out of their busy days to be part of this task force. And again, um, big congratulations to Council Member Garcia and to all of you guys. Thank you. Well said. Any other comments? Uh, yes. Um, so, are probably the one that has the most history uh, about this area. Um, unfortunately, what we did as a city, and I sit here, um, and I want to acknowledge what we did was wrong. Um, we took a barrio that was very vibrant, uh, economic development in, in parts of our city that our minorities or our Hispanic minorities lived in. Um, if you know the history of Arizona and Phoenix, uh, they, we were, there sections and pockets of segregation throughout our city. And uh, that was a very thriving barrio. Um, and little by little, uh, as a city, took that land. And uh, we could look at it in many different ways, but I'm just, I'm giving you the history. And the history is also with me, it's very personal because those were the neighborhoods I ran in. Those were all my friends and my families that lived there. Uh, my family still continues, if you, none of you know this, but uh, my family still continues to own land in that area. And uh, I student taught at Herrera School. So I'm very, very well familiar as to the impact it had. Um, and then my son uh, attended Herrera School, so I could see through my lens of time, how the neighborhood has changed. What I'm excited about is the fact that we're recognizing it and we're gonna revitalize it. I'm excited about the pocket park, B2, 
because literally uh, the kids could cross the street and we probably need it. There is a crosswalk there. Uh, uh, but uh, escort them to that pocket park in the sense of after school or hanging out. Uh, Sacred Heart is just down the street, so parishioners could also uh, use uh, the pocket park and then obviously the community college. But you also have other centers around there, uh, pieces and, and CPLC um, could use it. So I'm, I'm excited about the pocket park. I'm excited about the work that went into this to finally get it to where it is because it's been over, I taught maybe 20, 25 years ago, maybe more. And it's, it's, it's now at the space where we need to, to honor it. Uh, the other piece I had, a question I had is, I know that the FAA came out with regarding uh, the piece of housing. Um, that is in the, what, I wanna say 2008? Or where was that, that ruling? I can't remember when they, when it was written. Uh, Madam Chair, Councilwoman, appreciate the question. Uh, so that would have been uh, February of 2018 when 18. the FAA issued the letter on residential uh, mixed use okay in Spark One. As what? The, the letter was specific to mixed use residential, uh, vertical mixed use residential in Spark Area One, the, the Jefferson 14th Street. Right. I would like to go back and look at the other area in that corner pocket of 7th Street up by the freeway. Um, I would like to look at that to uh, be able to add some housing and the reason why I'm, I'm pushing is because that school uh, in order to get uh, funding is dependent on students going to that school. So a lot of those students come outside of the area and other districts because it is a performing arts and a dual language school. Um, but I want to look at implementing or putting in housing and I want to challenge it uh, because now with uh, possibly the coyotes right at the tip and be able to put housing, I think that that opens the door for us. Um, so I don't know at what phase that goes into, but I would like to look at that. Um, I'm looking at a, in a holistic way of how you rebuild some of that neighborhood. Um, because then, um, not Grant Park, it's on the other side of the, of the sevens, but I can't remember that little uh, enclave of homes and older homes and, and another body within there that uh, we can, you know, with, with the synergy that goes on, then that whole corridor then becomes revitalized. And that's kind of how I'm looking at it for the future. But great work, um, it's been a long haul. Uh, and I would really like to thank uh, Councilman Garcia because he knew the history and he knew what needed to happen in, in, in involving the community and healing some of the pieces that, that went on and be able to make it happen. Um, so. I'm glad it, it got here. I'm willing to, I think it's for discussion only. I don't know at what point. <laughs> I think we voted on it, but uh, I'm excited. So thank you. Councilwoman Abai. Thank you. On um, slide three, and you don't have to put it back up, but I just want you all to know where you have the map with the different, uh, I guess, the, the sound noise levels. So can you just, explain, sorry, in a little bit more detail for me because we have just had all this conversation about Tempe and, and what they want to do over there and, and how this has changed here. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Councilman O'Brien. I'm gonna turn it over to Jordan who's our expert in, in uh, the, the sound noise contours. Thanks, Chad, uh, Chairwoman, Councilwoman. Appreciate the question. Um, so I. It, it may be easier if, to, to show the slide, so excuse me if this sounds nerdy uh, w without the, the map. But so the noise contours, um, you know, are first essentially created for the CNRP program in 1989, and since 1989, with better aviation technology and the noise abatement procedures that the airport works with with FAA, uh, that 
community noise exposure has gone down. So when we started the CNRP program, we were sound insulating uh, all the way out to 19th Avenue on the west, and in the case of, uh, uh, to the east side, the, the North Tempe Neighborhood Association. Today, um, can I see that for one second? Thank you. Uh, today, that noise exposure is much less, let me see why animations are great, in, unless you want to go backwards. Uh, so, so what we're showing on this map are those 1999 contours, the, the 65 DNL in the yellow and the 70 DNL in the orange. Fast forward to today, and the noise exposure on the west side is this, much smaller. It covers a much smaller area. It's obviously, um, for the most part, is all east of 7th Street as opposed to 19th Avenue. So unlike Tempe, um, where the, the noise contour has certainly gotten smaller on, on the Tempe side, the east side as well, uh, the, that Tempe Entertainment District, which includes 2,000 residential units potentially, is still within the noise contour. So the equivalent on this map would be like Spark Area 3, putting in new residential. The, the question might hinge on this, why are we talking about residential in Spark Area 1? Well, for one, it's outside the 65 DNL, um, but there were a lot of specifics to the FAA's reasoning on that. It was on light rail. HUD, Housing and Urban Development, was giving out housing grants for projects around that same area. And the highest and best use, given the development in that area, was residential vertical mixed use. So I'm not sure if I touched on, on the issues you were wanting to get into there, but um, hopefully that helps. You absolutely did, and I appreciate that uh, additional clarification. And really just want to, one, uh, I'm going to go on a sidetrack and say congratulations on your Super Bowl on Monday, but to congratulations on all the great work uh, on this, and I, I look forward to supporting it. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, Madam, thank you again. Oh. I was just going to say, Madam Chair, I wanted to mention one thing really quick. Uh, when I introduced this item, I introduced Courtney as Courtney Brown and uh, not <laughs> Courtney Carter. I have no idea who Courtney Brown is, uh, so I'm sorry about that. I just wanted to apologize to you, Courtney, for that and, and get the correction on the record. So uh, thank you. Thank you. And we're glad you're here, Mr. Carter. <laughs> so our next item will be 12 Stormwater Excise Tax Assessment Update. Here to present on this item is uh, Planning and Development Director Josh Bednarik, along with uh, Tricia Balaf from the Office of Environmental Programs and Deputy City Manager Alan Stevenson. Great, and welcome. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Uh, I wanted to um, quickly introduce this item here this morning and uh, this is the uh, proposed stormwater excise tax uh, discussion that uh, is really something that is an outgrowth of a required permit that the city holds uh, that ADEQ issues that Tricia will discuss more in just a few moments. But by way of some background, I wanted to say that the Stormwater Executive Committee meets on a quarterly basis and is comprised of Streets Transportation Department Director, Water Director, uh, Office of Environmental Programs uh, Manager, as well as the Planning and Development Director. And this group has been meeting for a number of years to look at how we uh, deal with all of our stormwater because it is something that goes across many different departments. That's why those quarterly supervisors, uh, uh, managers meet so that we can make sure we are implementing our uh, MS4 permit requirements and doing the things we need to do to be in federal compliance uh, with the law as it relates to stormwater discharge. And so today's presentation will discuss the proposed uh, excise tax for stormwater. It is, uh, first we'll talk about the ADQ requirements for a municipal separate storm sewer system, commonly called MS4, uh, and then discuss the use of stormwater excise tax today, then the new MS4 permit requirements and the staff needed to meet those requirements, uh, and then a proposed excise tax increase that we are proposing to meet those requirements, and then uh, the next steps from there. And so with that, I will turn it over to uh, Tricia, who will walk us through the MS4 part of things. Thank you. 
Allen. Um, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. My name is Trisha Balif. I'm with the Office of Environmental Programs. And I will also be handing the presentation over in a little bit to Josh Bednarik with Planning and Development, who will also be here. We also have representatives from Street Transportation Department and Water Services Department in the room with us. So we are here today to brief you on the new requirements and obligations in the city's new stormwater permit and the associated proposed increase in the stormwater excise tax. The Federal Clean Water Act prohibits the discharge of pollutants into what is called waters of the United States without, unless we have a permit. The Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, or ADEQ, is the regulatory, author regulatory authority for this in Arizona. So ADEQ issues that Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System Permit, which try saying that three times fast, um, which we will call the MS4 permit from now on. This is a federally required permit as prescribed by the Clean Water Act. And this permit describes the conditions that allow the city to discharge our uh, flow from our storm drain system into protected surface waters, including waters of the US. So the city is required to comply with the conditions of our permit. So you might ask, well, why is stormwater regulated? <laughs> the city's stormwater infrastructure is actually quite broad. It includes things like catch basins, storm drains, our curbs and gutters even are part of the stormwater infrastructure, and our outfalls that all collect and convey water um, through, um, through these systems into retention and detention basins or into these protected surface waters. And these channels are things that you're familiar with for in a lot of cases, things like the Salt River, uh, Cave Creek Wash, Skunk Creek, Indian Bend Wash, these are all examples of protected surface waters. So while wastewater is collected and transferred to a wastewater treatment plant, stormwater is not treated. So the, it enters the storm drain system and it flows directly into these basins and these protected surface water channels. Now because it's not treated, as you can imagine, this stormwater can, it creates a, a pretty significant water quality <laughs> situation for, our, for these protected surface waters. So it can, stormwater picks up pollutants as it flows. This can be things like uh, chemicals, gas, oil, pet waste, trash, sediment, so many things um, can be picked up by stormwater and carried right into these, these water channels. So that is why stormwater is regulated as a main contributor to water pollution in protected surface waters, even here in the Sonoran Desert. The city stormwater program is, as Alan mentioned, a multi-departmental effort to comply with this permit, and it's funded by a stormwater excise tax that is assessed on city services bills. The Water Services Department, Street Transportation Department, Planning and Development Department, and the Office of Environmental Programs all have existing programs and activities that help keep the city in compliance with our MS4 permit. The stormwater excise tax supports this multi-departmental program, and this includes actions like water quality monitoring, inspections, reporting, investigations of illicit discharges, education and outreach, and infrastructure maintenance, just to name a few of the top um, categories. An increase in the stormwater excise tax is needed to meet the new MS4 permit requirements and keep the city in compliance with our permit. So this slide here indicates the proposed increase in the tax per meter size. And we project that this increase will support the program through at least 2028. Residential meters are highlighted here. They're usually either 5 eighths inch or 3 quarters inch in size. And they represent the, the vast majority of, of meter accounts in the city of Phoenix. And as you can see, the proposed increase for those accounts is 25 cents per month which adds up to a total of $3 additional per year for each of those residential meters. The new rate would provide funding for the new and expanded programs and practices required by the city's MS4 permit, supplying a total of approximately $2 million in additional revenue annually. So as we mentioned, the MS4's main goal is to reduce the discharge of pollutants to the maximum extent practicable. These permits are usually issued for a five-year term, and they are pretty complex permits. They have a lot of different components associated with them, um, some of which we went over earlier. 
And basically, these, these components and these requirements are unfunded mandates with which the city must comply. So the city's most recent stormwater permit became effective July 1st of 2021. And this new permit requires the implementation of new programs, such as the post-construction program, and the expansion of existing programs, like public outreach, inspect inspections, reporting, and mapping. Um, as we mentioned, multiple city departments are working together to meet these permit requirements, so we're now going to briefly discuss details of some of the additional department needs for permit compliance. So the first one we're going to talk about is the Water Services Department. Um, this increased tax would, uh, would support an additional two staff to undertake significantly increased permit requirements, including an, an annual public workshop and increased outreach, reporting, tracking, inspecting, and facility requirements. The increase will also support IT infrastructure and customization of compliance management tools and an annual software license for a compliance management database. Can I ask a question? Sure. Thank you. Um, it's item eight. This is for the water service department. So am I hearing that uh, this is going to include two new staff for the purpose of outreach and inspection and reporting? Um, yes, uh, Chair, Councilwoman, my understanding is Water Services Department, in order to um, achieve the, the needs of the expanded permit requirements associated with the activities with outreach, inspections, reporting, and uh, um, tracking, would, would require two additional staff to meet those needs. And what type of outreach would you be doing? So I don't know if you want to bring up water services. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Councilwoman Pastor, we can certainly uh, have the water department come up and talk about that. Uh, I, I want to add a little bit to what uh, Tricia just mentioned in that this uh, program and these uh, two positions are focused on stormwater management education, part of complying with our ADQ permit about explaining to people what they need to do to maintain their washes okay. uh, and their open space retention areas and those types of things. They also are the ones that will do enforcement uh, relative to, we have a, a tracking system that you'll hear about from Josh in, in a minute that goes through with, with new development, but the enforcement part of that then gets turned over. If somebody's not complying with the tracking requirements administered through planning development, it will go to these folks in water. So they would be spending some time educating people, but also enforcing uh, as well. Okay, that's what I was, that's what I wanted to know because um, we have outreach for water conservation and we have outreach for um, other pieces in the water department. So that's why I wanted to know what specific outreach would be happening in this space. Yeah, so uh, I'll give you a, a specific uh, example. You know, when uh, you have an HOA that has a, a residential subdivision and the residents are now responsible as part of electing the, the HOA and a management company, they have retention basins because they're required to have on-site retention that the planning and development department enforces at the beginning. And as part of outreach, they would go to those association meetings and explain what people have to do in order to comply with new ones that are going to be built in the future that are under this new MS4 permit. Got it. And then the other reason why I was asking is because I got a briefing yesterday and there are new positions or new, when we have the next conversation about the water piece, uh, there were positions set up in there. So that's why I'm, I see it's, I use it as a very global, as water, all these positions, and what I'm seeing is this is the silo piece of these two, two positions would be stormwater, and these two positions, or whatever, however many positions, would be for uh, other pieces. And so that's in my head that I'm trying to put everything together and understand that then this tax would then uh, for, provide two positions specifically for storm water. Okay, Correct. thank you. And this is strictly just well, rainwater running off or is it also include um, other types of water that run into the drains? 
So, Madam Chair, Councilwoman Pastor has it correct in the sense of because we are enterprise, the utilities have to remain separate. And so, because we have outreach associated with the stormwater program existing, and this would be expanding so that we can do an annual program as well as the individual outreach, as Alan kind of targeted, if that's what these positions would be because of the new permit activities. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so for the street transportation department, the tax would support um, actions by the street transportation department to proactively manage and maintain the storm drain system, including developing an asset management program to inform decision making related to storm drain capital improvement projects. This would also support a systematic citywide storm, sister, so, eh, storm system assessment and the site specific evaluation of up to 10 locations annually to proactively identify concerns and to help identify potential solutions to problem areas. The increased tax would cover annual technical support and a software license for a cloud based asset management program that would interface with other city systems. And I will now hand the presentation over to Josh Bednark with the Planning and Development Department. Thank you, Tricia. Madam Chair, the new MS4 permit requires the city to develop a post-construction program that will inventory, track, inspect, and confirm adequate maintenance of post-construction stormwater controls like retention and detention basins, stormwater pretreatment facilities, and dry wells. The program is currently in the development phase with, pay, with public stakeholder uh, meetings ongoing and will be managed out by the Planning and Development Department. The tax will specifically support new staff positions to develop and implement the program on data, database development, equipment and supplies, training development and educational outreach. These new positions will be added over the next five years as the program grows. The program manager for post-construction was added last year to begin developing the program. The position is currently in the Office of Environmental Programs, but will transition to the Planning and Development Department later this year. The post-construction program is currently in development with four stakeholder meetings complete and more planned in the future to get public input on the city's approach to the program. City staff have focused on creating a program that avoids unnecessary expense for implementation. We would like to note that the post-construction program is designed to minimize cost. Examples include citing the program in PDD to capitalize on existing expertise and plan review functions, incorporating the post-construction program database needs in the ongoing Shape Phoenix development process, and utilizing existing processes in the Street Transportation Department's GIS and Central Records divisions for management. The tax was originally approved by council during the fiscal year 1993-94 to defray costs associated with the city's MS4 permit then issued by the Environmental Protection Agency. Collection of the tax began in October 1993 and was set up as a graduated rate based on the water meter size on the, on the account as Trisha explained earlier. Since tax implementation there have only been two increases in 1997 and 2010 to accommodate expanded requirements of the city's latest MS4 permit. The current tax is 70 cents per single family residential meter. Josh, we have another question. I have a question on the training and outreach. What outreach happens in there? M Madam Chair, Councilwoman Pastor, Alan's going to cover next steps. Oh, okay. As part of this, we'll, we're going to highlight what we're going to be doing with outreach and training um, okay. in, in a couple of slides. Okay, perfect. We are, proposing, uh, we are proposing the increase the single family residential rate from 70 cents to 95 cents per month in accordance with the tax structure. The proposed increase is scaled at a graduated rate by meter size using the equivalent dwelling unit methodology. This tax is proposed to become effective October 1st, 2023. Staff projects that this increase will raise sufficient revenue to cover the cost of complying with the MS4 permit for at least the next five years to October 2028. We have researched stormwater fees from several similar cities that operate under a municipal separate stormwater system permit. Of the cities investigated, the closest equivalents to Phoenix for activities using the fee are Scottsdale, Arizona, San Antonio, Texas, and Oklahoma City. These cities have monthly residential stormwater fees ranging from $3.75 to $10.45 a month. 
The city of Scottsdale has a flat stormwater fee of $6.10. The city of Mesa has a flat environmental fee of $7.32. That includes stormwater, air, and hazardous waste programs. We would like to note that although both Scottsdale and Mesa have similar permits to Phoenix with similar requirements, they are much less uh, com complex and expansive. I'll now turn it over to Alan to talk about next steps in public outreach. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, our, this uh, proposed excise tax is one that uh, the city is scheduling to go along uh, the same time as being discussed about the water rate increase so that there'll be public outreach and input about the proposal in March and April and then coming to the council hopefully for action uh, on May 31st and then effective date of October 1st, 2023. And so we will be working closely with the, the water department uh, on their outreach for the water rate increase and as part of our, our outreach and doing uh, those joint meetings to make sure that we are informing everyone about that and we're happy to discuss any specifics or suggestions that you guys would, would like on that. Um, and then as part of, of changing changes here in the city manager's uh, office with uh, Karen's retirement, uh, you know, I will be taking over the lead of the stormwater management uh, and Ginger will be taking the lead on the water uh, rate change uh, as the water department. And so we'll be meeting with Karen and the water team on all of our public outreach stuff uh, that's coming up. And we are, we're happy to take input from you guys on what you'd like to do, where you'd like us to focus on that. The one thing I would like to, to mention to uh, touch on your question, I believe Councilwoman Pastor, is that Part of what the outreach includes with the planning and development department is training private sector folks on what they need to submit and do. So the, the, the outreach component from water is talking generally about here's what you need to do to maintain you know, your storm water things and, and, and those bigger enforcement cases where what we have envisioned in order to keep costs down is instead of there being a, a big city program it is uh, having the private sector be able to be trained on what they would need to do so that the HOA can submit the necessary materials and then planning development department is tracking compliance with that and then doing some spot checks based upon that to make sure that yes, they are in fact uh, physically doing the things they need to do by going out and looking at those sites. And so it's that kind of outreach in that instance. Yeah, so as part of the outreach, the education, uh, you are going to uh, give good examples of the, the, the difference in the stormwater excess tax as opposed to where we raise rates with water because we're going to be doing this kind of at the same time and I want people to understand the distinction between stormwater as we all experienced last night, <laughs> a lot of stormwater, but and then how does that differ than what we're going to be doing with the water rates? And maybe that's part of the next presentation. I'm not sure. Madam Chair, uh, members of the subcommittee, that is an excellent point, and you're absolutely right. We will make sure as part of our outreach we are explaining both of them and what the need is for them and why they are separate, which gets uh, kind of at Councilwoman Pastor's question as to what's, why is there two staff here for this and there's more you know, on the the water side and so we will explain and talk about all of that and it, it ultimately goes back to uh, the water utility as, as Troy mentioned and what we have to do but we'll make sure that that's clear. And then there is also the distinction in the different uh, regulations as imposed uh, by the federal government upon us and so that I hope will be a part of the discussion as well which I think you were mentioning as well. Yes Madam Chair, uh, Council Pastor will make sure that's part of it. It can get very confusing. It, there's going to be, <laughs> I know we're not in the next one yet, but uh, there's going to be have to be a lot of clarity mm -hmm. on what is happening because I'm going to play the citizen and uh, I'm looking at, I am now, your city's coming out to the neighborhood uh, explaining three different taxes. So there's going to be, have to be a lot of uh, discussion on how this is going to be delivered um, and examples and why. Um, 
So that's, that's why I'm, asking, I'm like, okay, what is the plan? Um, it's good to hear that it's gonna, it, you guys are going to uh, do outreach collectively at, as a collaboration. Uh, I think that's good. And to be able then to explain all the different pieces that are gonna be coming our way. Um, so my, I'm looking at, I'm looking at your next steps and then I'm looking at the water's next steps. And they're a little off. Okay, oh no, they're not. I don't have my glasses. Okay, so May 31st, you will be coming to formal. Okay. Mayor, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Council Investor, yes, that is our uh, proposal at this time to do the public outreach and then we're targeting that May 31st uh, for council action. And obviously we will be back to brief you uh, as we're going through the, the public meetings and getting input and talk with you guys before we show up on the 31st. I have one more question and I think it's for the lawyer. Um, a while back, aviation, this is uh, a while back in, in aviation, they kept coming to us about fees and, and it seemed like every year or every six months they were coming about fees. And so I had asked staff at that time saying, hey, you have to come to us every, every year it seems. Why are we, would we be, be able to give the director the authority than to uh, be able when a fee needs to go or, or a tax needs to go up. Um, if we give the director authority that in those in f four years, I think it was, or five years, I can't remember, four years, you have the authority to go out to the community and say we're going to have uh, an additional excise tax, or not additional, but we're gonna, going to raise it or hike it. and. At the time, Jim Bennett had that authority, and so the, he didn't have to keep coming to us uh, for approval because we gave him the authority that within four, four year span, you're able to do this much, and then we gave some boundaries around it. Is that possible for this? Or, I know there's different rules, so that's why I'm asking. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Councilwoman Pastor, there are different rules associated with this kind of thing and we would have to look into and research how that would actually be implemented but you're right it depends on what you're asking for how you do the the outreach how you do the the notification how you do the setup and how you would uh, roll that out but we can certainly find that out for you thank you i'm just curious and i think my colleagues are too <laughs> um, thank you chairwoman the I just want to understand the new the new rules. Are they retroactive for, to all stormwater assets or just to new ones? Thank you, Councilman Chair. Um, it depends on which part of the stormwater program we're talking about. So um, <laughs> I, it is a complex permit. So um, in some instances, for example, for existing features such as what Alan was talking about with the existing retention basins and, and filter inserts and things like that, water services does have some responsibilities and authority over all that existing infrastructure um, now and in the future and, and the new permit requirements some of those that water deals with do deal with existing infrastructure. Now, the new program for that planning and development is implementing for post-construction, that um, during permit negotiations, we, we were able to get that, to, so it only applies to these post-construction stormwater controls, what we call them, like retention, detention basins, from July 1st, 2022 on. So it will not retroactively apply to existing. So it depends on which part of the stormwater program you're talking about. Okay, I, I think that's clear as stormwaters. <laughs> <laughs> Ma um. Madam Chair uh, and members of, of the subcommittee, I can uh, maybe try and clarify a little bit and maybe add to that. So, uh, and you should correct me if I'm wrong, but the the permit requirements that are 
apply to old subdivisions are, are largely the same under our existing MS4 permit. The HOA still had to maintain them and do the things that, that they have to do that ultimately would bring the water department in if they weren't doing that on a complaint basis. So that largely didn't change. Um, the only change that is new is the reporting and requ system that has to be put in place about new development, which is, is proactive monitoring. And so that one is not retroactive, but the stuff that applies to existing residents today applied under the MS4 permit anyways that was in place prior to the new one. So the biggest change for current, uh, um, going forward, is that current HOAs won't have that reporting requirement, uh, unlike new HOAs? In Correct. The communities. Correct. As of that uh, July 22 date. For for this current MS4 um, permit. Okay. Um, and I I do want to re reiterate my fellow councilwomen's uh, request that uh, we make sure folks understand this is a federal law that then comes from the state, so that we understand, you know, the requirements that this isn't something the city just thought up on their own. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Are there any questions? Well, thank you so much. We'll move on to item 13. Lucky 13, we're gonna talk about the water services. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry, Troy, I had to say it. <laughs> water services financial plan update and water allowance adjustment. And Karen Peters is coming up. This is her last subcommittee meeting and she's off to the state where she'll be the head of DEQ and she'll make sure we comply with stormwater, correct? <laughs> Thank you, welcome. Thank you, oh boy. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the subcommittee. I'm very happy to be here this morning to introduce this item. Um, we've talked about this uh, on and off over the years. Uh, I would just wanna reiterate that the city of Phoenix has one of the strongest water and wastewater utilities in the United States. Also one of the biggest uh, in the United States and among the very most affordable in the United States. And all of those things are a result of decisions that the mayors and councils over the years have made uh, to invest in the utility and keep it strong. So what we're here to talk about today is uh, a continuation of that effort. I will introduce Troy Hayes, our Water Services Director, to talk us through it. Thank you. Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee, we are excited today, especially under item 13. We appreciate the <laughs> order. Um, I think they're working on bringing the presentation up. We can go over the objectives of the task force of the cultural corridors from the aviation department until then. It looks like we're creating a little drama here. Here we go. <laughs> that looks right. All right. All right, so one thing that we do understand living in the desert is the value of water. As we know, water and wastewater service are the cornerstone of our quality of life, economic development, and public health and safety. And Phoenix must provide reliable water deliveries for all of our customers. So, and all it, of, yeah. I hate to interrupt, but it looks like it's not appearing on the screens, but it's appearing on your screens. It is. It's on our screens. Uh, I have it on mine. Are you trying to hide information I, from us? I am <laughs> most <laughs> seriously am not. Yeah, as it was everybody a knows. There we go. All okay. right. <laughs> we'll try again. Yeah. One thing that we understand living in the desert is the value of water. As we know, water and wastewater service are the cornerstone of our quality of life, economic development, public health, and safety. 
and Phoenix must provide reliable water deliveries to all of our customers. And all of these require certainty, provisions of safe, clean water. The financial, operating, and capital plans are all built to meet the mission of the department, which is to provide reliable, cost-effective water services to meet the public needs and to maintain support. The goal of the financial plan is to maintain the trust that we have built with our customers through safe, reliable systems. We must exceed regulatory requirements while responsibly rehabilitating, replacing critical infrastructure and systems. We have seen in the news stories where a lot of the city, or there are some cities and utilities across the nation that have not done this. We want to maintain our very high bond ratings to minimize our costs when we have to borrow money for that infrastructure. And all of this is done while we balance affordability. We'll now break down and look at the water and wastewater financial plans. This slide gives an overview of the water utility operations and maintenance budget for this fiscal year. And I want to point out the, the two largest pieces of the pie there. Uh, the one component is personnel costs, and the other one we call the big three costs. Or the big three for the water utility would be um, electricity, chemicals, and raw water. Similarly, this slide gives an overview of the wastewater utility operations and maintenance budget for this fiscal year. On this one, we want to point out the, the transfer of the $35 million payment from the wastewater utility to the water utility for expenses incurred on its behalf, the personnel costs, and the big two, because in the case of a wastewater utility, it's just chemicals and electricity. You don't necessarily have to pay for the raw water that's coming down. Both utilities have experienced significant cost increases associated with, associated with inflationary pressures. This issue is not isolated to Phoenix, as other water and wastewater utilities across the nations have experienced these pressures, causing the need for similar revenue increases. Over the next series of slides, I want to step through some of the inflationary increases that we've seen. We've seen a 35% increase in raw water costs associated with the drought conditions, and I've accounted for the potential of a Tier 3 shortage as early as next year. We all know that water, raw water costs could be much higher if those estimates or further cuts on the Colorado River occur. For electricity, we've seen a 12% increase on the water side and a 17% increase on the wastewater utility. The water utilities experience a dramatic 136% increase in its chemical cost and a 51% increase for wastewater. And over the past few years, we've experienced vacancies in key operating positions. To address these issues, the department had class and compensation stu studies done on positions in the call center. We've also made adjustments for the staff that are out in the street repairing water mains and sewer mains. And most recently, we completed the, with the council support the increase of the water and wastewater oper plant operators. And in the next few years, we've also included estimates of increasing associated with future compensation changes that the department will experience. As we pre previously presented to this subcommittee, this is a representation of the Waters Capital Improvement Program with the major categories that are going to be addressed the largest areas are involving the continued investment in our water pipes and treatment plants. For the wastewater five-year capital improvement program, the largest groups are the wastewater pipes and plants as well. The five-year plan has the reestablishment of the Cave Creek Water Reclamation Facility with the redesign and construction. We will have treatment technology installed to introduce the city's first advanced water purification plant to deliver a new water resource to the areas currently served by the Colorado River. Over the next series of slides, I want to compare our new proposed rates to other cities. In this first slide, we're comparing the proposed rates to the, of water and wastewater to the largest cities in the southwest. We are in the middle for both of, for on the water side and on the lower end on the wastewater side. But one thing to note on these slides is we are comparing our future rates to the current rates of these other cities. And we know that most of these cities will also be requesting rate changes, like El Paso's 20% rate increase, or San Diego's 18%. This is a similar, similar chart to the largest 20 cities in the US with a similar pattern of on the water side, we're in the middle, um, and on the wastewater side, on the lowest end. They're again comparing our potential future rates to their current rates. And then another slide comparing the water and wastewater providers in the local area with our proposed rates being in the middle for both of these of their current rates. 
In 2022, the University of New Mexico updated the study on water wastewater services affordability in the U.S. The graph on the left represents our rates as a percentage of disposable income for the 20th percentile of the income class. As those potential identified as the most vulnerable. The graph on the right is the number of hours that need to be worked at a minimum wage to provide basic water and wastewater services. And in both graphs, Phoenix Rakes is some of the most affordable in the U.S. Um, and that's where on this chart, you really want to be towards the bottom um, if, as perspective. And as you can see on both of those, we are at the very bottom. We are showing here the historic revenue adjustments since 1994 for the water utility. On average, the water revenue adjustments have been around 5 or 6 percent per year. When utilities experience no increases, it places pressures in a few areas, either the available fund balance or how much we have in reserve, future increases, or stresses on the capital program. This is a historic wastewater revenue adjustments with an average of 5 percent a year. The last increase was 2 percent in 16 and 17, and prior to that, 2010. Again, the zero percents add pressure to the fund balances, future rate increases, or the capital program. We've shown this graphic and other discussions about water conservation. This shows that over the past 30 years, our customers have embraced conservation initiatives, lifestyle changes, and dropped our per person water use by over 30 percent, and thus decreasing our average water usage. Our current rate structure was established in 1990 and has two rates in its most simplest form. The, rate, the fixed rate is applied to all customers that contains a certain amount of water meant to provide basic water service at a variable affordable cost. The amount of water above those levels are then subject to our variable rate charges. We are proposing to lower the amount of water included in the basic charges by a ratio of the average of the water use in 1990 when the allowance was created as compared to our current levels. The proposed change will better align water allowance levels with the current average water use and have a larger portion of the water usage under the volumetric rate, and thus we believe further incentivizing water conservation. With discussions with our Water Rate Advisory Committee, we feel that these levels strike the balance between water conservation and affordability, and having a portion of the customer's water usage included in the low monthly rate uh, base rate allows some conscientious water customers to receive water services at very low rates while making the utility one of the most affordable in the nation. While any burden to our customers may experience due to these rate changes or changes in the allowance, it is worth noting that many of the customers will be able to mitigate the impacts to the allowance change on their bill without investing in expensive appliances or landscaping. This analysis shows that if a single family homes were to water their existing landscape using our recommended watering schedules and fix all of the leaks in their homes, they would reduce their water use by nearly four units a month or double the maximum proposed changes in the allowance levels. Can I ask a yeah. yep. On that slide, um, what was mentioned was if they did, if they uh, repaired their leaks and did all this uh, preventative maintenance, then uh, they would be able to lower their water rate. Um, what programs do we have and what incentives do we have for people that don't have the ability to do that? And, um, and that would cause a burden on them, additional stress and financial stress. So. I'm curious about that. Um, so and Madam how do Chair, you qualify? Yep. Is there a qualification? So Madam Chair, uh, Councilman Pastor, I have it actually in the two more slides um, that will go through those. And for our programs that we're rolling out, there is no qualification base for the ones that we're proposing, but it's actually two slides forward. Uh, in addition to our other conservation programs you've heard about at previous meetings, we have specific programs targeting overwatering leaks where you, that we would like to highlight. And perhaps the most important of these is the text-based reminders operated by AMWAR, the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association. One. And anyone who signs up will receive monthly text alerts uh, with detailed instructions about how to keep their watering on track. And for those of, that are uncomfortable or unable to text, the watering guides are available online through our website or physically from the department. And they're actually located at many nurseries. 
And so what you would say is going back to this one to kind of respond to Councilwoman Pastors, is you can see most of what we're looking at is overwatering. And so through the studies that we've done through our conservations group is we've actually identified um, the usages that are happening at single family residential houses. And we're finding that for the majority of, of those houses is they're overwatering their landscaping. And so this is where we think uh, of adapting and going on with our watering guides is the first step of doing that, which is at no cost. It's just adjusting of how they're watering. The department will be rolling out new conservation initiatives, many of which will start this summer. We are enhancing our toilet replacement program with a $75 residential bill credit for the installation of a low flow toilet. We will also have a $75 residential bill credit for the installation of a new irrigation controller. And with our work with the Arizona State University, we will be providing free zeroscape landscaping plans that can be adapted to, our household, to your household and give ideas and concepts for those individuals that are wanting to change their landscaping but need a little help with some ideas. And later this winter, we are rolling out the non-residential turf program aimed at removing non-functional turf from those areas that, that really have non-functional turf, and that would be the commercial or HOAs, and it's not being utilized. The department will start an outreach program highlighting these programs and we will directly reach out to some of our customers that receive bill assistance from the department or they have been identified as having bills that may be affected by the change in the allowance level. The de department will then offer a, a home audit that we will come out and identify areas where water can be conserved. Those households that were, el those households once completing that program will then be eligible for a $150 irrigation controller rebate um, for, for participating in that audit. And what we think is, is going through that audit um, with those individuals that we've identified receiving assistance um, and, and doing the things that, to reduce their leaks um, and overwatering inside the house and then that coupled with an irrigation controller that they can use outside that we believe then that would re reduce their water usage of the four units that we're talking about um, in the allowance level. The takeaways are that Phoenix's water services are afford affordable. Inflationary impacts are drastically affecting both the operating and capital budgets as seen throughout our industry. And in the, water, and in the wastewater capital program, we will be reestablishing the Cave Creek Water Reclamation Plant with the treatment technologies that will add additional water resources to the north. On January 26th, the Water and Wastewater Rate Advisory Committee unanimously recommended the proposed revenue adjustments as well as adopting the changes to the allowance levels to stronger message water conservation. For the average single family home, the impact of this proposal will be most noticeable in October of 2023 as noted above due to the proposed changes in the allowance levels. As I previously stated, we believe that the allowance levels changes can be overcome with adjusting of the outside water use and repairing of the leaks. One of the next steps is to start an extensive outreach program to get feedback from our community. This includes public meetings, bill and social media messaging. Uh, we are also open, open to come to any meetings out in the council districts and we're basically willing to go anywhere, any, anywhere that some people are willing to listen to us um, over the next few months. The next steps after our discussion today would be to come to a policy meeting on March 21st to request a notice of intent to consider the proposed code and revenue changes and for that to set a public hearing date on May 31st. As the previously shown, the proposal rate changes would be implemented in October of later this year. With that, I can answer any questions. As part of your public outreach, um, we'll be able to invite you to, I know a lot of us have coffee chats and perhaps you can come and give a presentation there as well. It doesn't look like you're trying to do separate meetings in each of the districts, so are you relying on maybe our coffees? Or? Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, um, that's exactly what we were looking at. And I think that's where we've, in the past rate discussions, where we've had the most dialogue and the, and the most fruitful discussions. Um, we're planning on going to all the village planning committees as those are established and we're currently on the agendas in April and May. But then, then going back and making contacts yeah, with each council district okay. as to what particular groups that they want us to come speak with or coffee chats or other things like that. And so it'll be a... A, a real busy couple of months there as we're out and about. 
And if I could add, Madam Chair, uh, we are planning to have tables at the budget meetings that occur in all of the districts. Councilman Rudolph. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Well, well, first off, I just wanted to make sure that whatever it is that we do, and, and look, and I understand the conversations that we've been having, um, everything that's happening with our water, I 100% understand that, but I do think that we need to have open dialogue with, with, all, with all of our neighbors. I think that it's very important that we are transparent and that we're able to, now that we're adding something else, right, the discussion that we were just having, this is all very, I mean, if it's, if it's been a little confusing for all of us sitting up here, that we've all gotten briefings um, for a while, I can only imagine what this is gonna be like for our residents. Because if we really look at this, we're looking to raise water rates, we're looking to reduce the water allocation ratepayers receive each month, and I think that we really have to go out there and really explain that to folks. And then we're also talking about raising wastewater rates. So I, I think it's important that we figure out a way, how is it that we bring that whole conversation together and that we're able to explain that to folks. I think it's important that we talk to the residents, that we explain each component of this and why all of this is important. I don't, I don't think people are opposed to this. I just think that constituents um, don't like when we don't explain things to, fo to them before we actually take an actual vote. And I will just use, you know, for an example, um, the use of force changes that we've made within the police department. You guys have no idea how many phone calls and how many residents I've had to talk to within District 5 that were upset that there was no outreach to them before these changes went into place. And I just think that if we don't go and we don't talk to our residents about these changes that we want to make before we even bring this on, what is it, in March? Like, if we don't do all that outreach before then, I just think people are going to be upset. I think that, you know, there's nothing worse than a resident or a constituent that feels disrespected or that feels that we're taking them for granted because this is, this is something that needs to get done and I think that <clears throat> neighbors definitely have great ideas. I mean, around the different things that we're thinking about doing when it comes to conserving water and the different programs, we should take that out to them and see if they have ideas. I know that there's a lot of residents that might have the means to be more helpful with this and we should just give them that opportunity before we take this vote. And I'm also concerned that this proposal is coming, you know, before, before we go to them. I really think that we need to go out to the residents. Um, I mean, we have it as part of our budget. We do um, a budget survey every year um, within District 5. Last year, we did a little bit over 500 surveys. Our, our goal this year is to get a little bit over 1,000. If Emmanuel's listening, he's probably gonna kill me. Um, but, you know, we're, we're definitely gonna get out there. And, it, and it's one of the questions, and, and we're willing, um, as, as a council office, we're willing to go out there and have the difficult conversations with our residents. But I think as a city, we have to do the same thing. I know we did some meetings in the past, but I just don't think that that's enough um, in terms of what we need to um, talk to people. And the, and the discussion that I think we need to have with folks, we need to talk about the incentives to remove grass and install desert landscaping and what are some incentives around that, incentives to install pool covers for single family homes um, with pools, collaboration with organizations like Trees Matter and our local utility companies to provide residents with drought res resistant shade trees and also include expanding programs to quickly address water and sewer leaks at single family homes, incentives to enroll in water auditing programs to find where residents can best improve their water usage. I know we have a lot of residents that don't understand why they're wasting so much water, so the more that we can help folks with that, I think it's incredibly important. But again, I'll, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, like without the public input, I, I just think that we are gonna, we're gonna disrespect a lot of people, we're gonna piss off a lot of people, 
that I think would be okay with this, but if we don't take this to them first, I can see a lot of neighbors coming back and saying that we're taking them for granted because this is something um, that needs to get done. I don't, I don't think that people are opposed to this. I just think we just got to bring them and bring them and be part of that conversation. And as the largest city in the, count, in the country, in the county, uh, we need to get this right. I would ask that we bring this item back to the March TIP subcommittee meeting to ensure the proposal includes a robust public outreach campaign that takes place before we support consideration of proposed rate increases and that the programs and incentives help residents reduce their water usage are all up and running. I, I really think we have to get it right. I am more than happy to be helpful with this and for us to really like push this through. Like I, I think it's important, but I do think that it is important um, to take this to the residents first. I'm seeing, you know, I think we just need a more robust campaign on how we're gonna do outreach and then working, you know, like, like um, the chairwoman says, our coffee talks and all the different things that we need to do. I think all of that is important, but I think we need to do that before we take any, any, any kind of vote. But if you think we can get it all done before March 21st or whatever date that is, I think, um, I think I can be comfortable with that, but I just think that all of that needs to be in place either by the 21st or we, or we revisit some of these dates. Thank you. Um, Councilwoman O'Brien has a question. Thank you for those comments. Thank you. And I'm not sure who to direct this question at, but the March 21st, 2023 notice of intent to consider a proposed increase to water and wastewater rates and set public hearing date, what does that um, vote mean? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair, uh, Councilwoman O'Brien, that vote sets the hearing date at which you will vote on the rate increase, which is proposed in the current schedule to be on May 31st. So when you vote on March 21st, you would be setting that date and in starting the 60-day clock for, for that outreach and such to... And are to, there any other requirements in that 60 days prior to the vote on... I mean, I, I, what I hear you saying is we are voting to say we can then vote on the vote for or against a rate cr increase on May 31st. Right. But are there any other requirements as a city that we have to meet within that 60-day period prior to that vote? Madam Chair, uh, Councilman O'Brien, yes. Yeah, so there are some publications that we do to do with the clerk's office and in some publications um, that have to happen within that 60-day period. Um, but that's usually the period in which we're doing the outreach to then come to council with all of the information that we've heard from uh, the residents to give them you know, informed decision making before they're actually voting on the rates. Okay. Um. So there's a, a state statute of the 60 day period um, between the notice of intent to an actually, where you can actually have a vote for increasing a water and wastewater rates. Um, and, so which is why that 60-day period is there. Okay, and the implementation of October 2023 is that um, uh, because you have to have the vote by May 31st to have implementation by October? No, not necessarily. And so we usually choose the October May timeframes to implement changes because that's when we'll be coming off the summer rates. And so it's less um, burdensome potentially to residents. Um, because the, our seasonal rates will be changing on October 1st. We'll be coming off of the summer rate into the shoulder months. Okay. All right. But there's nothing special necessarily with the October date. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Pastor. How was May 31st chosen? Um, so I believe May 31st was chosen because we wanted to get it within this fiscal year while keeping in mind of um, making sure that we had a full council set. Um, so that all happens in April and so sometime in Who May. Who chose it? Who made the decision? So uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, so we've been working with the finance department, with the city manager's office, the water, water, water 
wastewater rate advisory committee throughout this process to identify these next steps and the feasible dates. Obviously, the law department has a lot to say about uh, the timing according to the statutory requirements and what we need to post with the city clerk. So this has been an iterative conversation and those dates were the ones that were optimal. Okay, so law chose? I'm trying to figure out who, who finally blessed that date. It was a group. It was at the committee? Conversation. It was a conversation. So yes. somebody has to eventually bless that date. So it's yes. either um, Madam a, Chair, a, a, a committee that said this looks good, or it's a conversation with the city manager, or the deputy city manager. I'm, I'm trying to figure out who chose the date. But again, there wasn't an individual who chose the date. So it was there a collective. Were, there were conversations had with the law department that informed the, the schedule, and then we would propose dates that the Water Rate Advisory Committee heard and saw, and then we talked through all of that with the finance department, the city manager, communications department, and, and others just to identify okay. options. So the reason why I'm asking this question is because nobody talked to council. On these dates nobody came to council and said hey we're thinking about or we're going to propose these dates and kind of to back it up as uh, councilwoman O'Brien was saying what are the what are the nuances I also use the term nuances uh, what are the the nuances as to when we take this vote in March and what is the noticing and the pieces because I am hearing, and I'm just listening, I am hearing that this date may be not the right date. And so is it possible, I'll ask legal, and I don't know finance, uh, if it's possible to move the date to a June formal, or even when our last vote is, a July, um, so that we can get some of these pieces that uh, need to be done and still fall within the fiscal calendar and everything else that goes into making the decision. Um, that's kind of the discussion uh, I want to want to have amongst us um, to say, okay, we're having some concerns. Um, here are some of the, the dynamics. Um, is there another date that, and that would be up to you guys to determine that and, and come talk to us, is there another date that then works? Because I don't think, and I'm just gonna be critical on this piece, the outreach plan I don't think is as robust as it has been in the past um, when we've done rate, rate hikes. Going to 15 village planning commissions is great, but that's a very select few. And a lot of our villages, uh, those that are participate, um, probably, probably can afford it. Um, and so my dynamic is the community that can't afford it and what's going to come about and how they're going to have to prepare, prepare financially for these increases, even though for some at 25 cents, or I think that was a storm water, but whatever it is, uh, is, does impact in many different ways. And I know that we did an affordability study, but what I'm also curious about, what's our poverty within, within Phoenix? And what does that look like within Phoenix? And where are our pockets of poverty rate? So that then we can also, I mean, really um, strategize and go into those communities to say, this is what's happening. Um, I, and I, you're just getting my reaction as I was listening. My other piece is that 
when it says the department will con uh, conduct direct outreach to all impacted customers in low income communities. That's why I'm asking what's the poverty rate because I want to see if you have enough staff to go out into those communities to do these things. Um, and once, you, once they discover it, it doesn't look like there are some incentive programs, but there are not enough incentive programs for people to change people's behavior, especially if you have a leak. And the reason why I, I have an example, I have a neighbor who rents the house. There has been a leak in that house, I want to say for the last six months. And I have gen gingerly knocked on the door and said, there's a leak, you know, it's now getting into the foundation. Um, and the, the renter says, well, that's not my responsibility. You know, uh, that's the management company. Management company doesn't really want to do something. And so this leak is happening in this historic home as I watch it gradually deteriorate. But my point is, these are situations throughout our whole city. And so how do we really do a good outreach practice to prevent for the future? And I know I went on a tangent, but these are just some of the things that happens within our community as, as we want people to conserve, but they don't have the ability to do it. And so how do we close that gap? And that's just really one of my concerns in all of this. Um, but I'm hoping that we can get a date. If this date doesn't work, I don't know. Um, I understand that you know we need to do this and we want to do it by October, uh, but how do we back ourselves in? So that's just a suggestion. Thank you. And it, I think you're also looking at the same time we're talking about the rates, about all the programs we might have available to help mm -hmm. um, achieve conservation. So it's like a twofold, not just educating on the increases, but what's available out there. Mm -hmm. So it is quite a process. Um, and I would agree we might need to back it up a little bit just so we can make sure we're doing a robust um, outreach. And Councilwoman Ward, okay, thank you. And I, and I think just to, um, just, just to follow up with what, just, what was just said, um, I guess just a question for you, Troy. What is our, our debt right now? Is it still 11,000 accounts that are delinquent? Uh, Madam Chair, Councilman Guerrero, um, yeah, I think it's in the last time that I looked, it was, yeah, like 6,000 accounts or so for $4 million is what the delinquency rate currently is. So I think adding to that, I, I just think we just have to deal with that debt and figure out a plan also with, with those residents and seeing how is it that we can be helpful, what type of plans we can put them in so they can also pay pay down their debt. I just think if this is very comprehensive, and again, I think we're all willing to be helpful. I don't think this is, I don't think any of us are saying that that any of what, that that this is not overdue. We, we understand that. Um, but at the same time, it just has to be a very comprehensive plan, very robust. I know last time we did something like this, you know, you know, Ginger did a really great job in terms of doing community outreach and doing the meetings, and and we were really able to explain to people why we were doing the increases before. So I wouldn't expect less than that, right? In terms, and and this is something that's very delicate because we already have folks that are having a hard time um, paying paying their water bills. So we just need to figure out how is it that we can be helpful with that. And with the summer months amongst us, it's only going to get worse. So we can also figure out that piece. I, I think that'd be great. So I, I think I'm hearing a consensus on the next steps. Maybe after five, we add a number six that says start, start outreach now with education and then um, set the rate either May or uh, April or May and then continue to do the extensive outreach and then come back to us June, July, and that would still enable you to implement the October fee 
should we, well, it has to pass, but. Chairwoman. Oh, yes. I just want to make sure we take into account the 60 day yeah, notice that, of that's intent. Right. I know you have and to have the 60 day Because there's publications and I just want to make sure it's, it's just publications that have to occur during that 60 days. None of these outreach meetings April. are required. Not required by law. No, no. By law. So okay. if, if we're going to yeah. back it up, we're talking about having it at an, an April policy yeah. session? Yeah. Is that? That would that's, work. That's would not work right. Yes. And does that, that would still work for our time frame because I do think that that is, it is in our best interest to, you know, if, if the council votes for uh, rate increase for them to occur when uh, we're going into that time of year where, where rates are a little bit lower. Um, and I think it is important to note that you all did do the study to look at how many folks, how many of our accounts would fall under um, the, the amount of water that would be changed that's already in, included in your bill and how many would fall just out of it or would see a less significant change. Um, I'm sure part of your outreach would be in the water bill itself to let folks know about when they could hear about these different things. I think having information at the budget hearings is incredible. Um, I know that you know I'm committed as well as several of my other council members to have you all at a community meeting. I think it's important for folks to understand the big picture with water, which includes the Colorado River um, situation with tier, you know, I think you said tier three cuts that could be coming. And, and I'm thankful to the prior, you know, council and, and you, Karen, for ensuring we put in the infrastructure uh, given what can happen with these upcoming uh, water cuts and that it's important for our community members to understand what it takes financially to ensure they have safe water um, delivered to their homes. I know we're in great shape with our 100 year assured water supply, but we do need to make sure we're, we are being um, responsible going forward. So thank you, Chairwoman. No, thank you. And I, I, I always forget in July we only have the one meeting, so I apologize. I, I, I do I do know math. It doesn't look like it right now, but <laughs> did you have any other comments? Councilwoman? Is it so are you, it's is are we oh, on? oh okay, I'm sorry, I wasn't I'm sorry. Keep your head out of the way. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so I guess in this conversation if we back it up one month, April, of the notice of intent, uh, and, uh, intent yeah, right. uh, that gives us the time that we need. Okay. okay. That's what we need to know. Wonderful. Here, woman, we, I mean, I'm trying to look at my calendar, but it looks like we only have one policy meeting in April, so you, we can't actually back it up a full month. We can only back it up a few weeks. April 11th is okay. the only scheduled policy meeting in okay. April. However, yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure that we didn't get ourselves. No, I just want to make sure we meet our 60 days and are able then to get the vote and everything Absolutely, else, so. and I just didn't want us to ca get right. caught up in a. And that'll still give us a. a additional two to three weeks okay perfect is that okay thank you um, as we embark on a journey <laughs> together I appreciate it um, and then uh, on the agenda last is called to the public do we have any new and then are there any future agenda items okay we are adjourned thank you so much we're gonna miss you Karen <laughs>Used for daycare, uh, so they they know all this uh, problem.